and ran to Eli and he said, I, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, lie down again. So he went and he lay down again. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, for you did call me. And he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man, Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord called and came and stood and called at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning when he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and he said, Samuel, my son, and he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Thank you, Roger. Also, uh, thank you, Sam, for, for leading and, and Ada uh, and for just sharing uh, what God has been doing in your life. And it's just uh, really encouraging to see how God is using one of our members of the church to reach out and disciple uh, many people. This is one of my favourite uh, passages and uh, it's just a real encouragement to just to be able to share it with you this morning. So let's, before I do, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we uh, thank you for your word, uh, your word which is so challenging and yet so encouraging and inspiring, your word which uh, teaches us about your amazing grace and your great love for us. And I pray that these uh, things may come through as we study your word this morning, that uh, it may encourage us, it may challenge us, uh, but most of all, it may teach us about yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess uh, most of us have heard uh, uh, Christians say, I have felt called to do this, or... Uh, I have felt the call of God on my life. Uh, 
This person may have felt the call of God, for example, to go to uh, the mission field or they might have felt a sense of call to go to one of their neighbours and, and talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. I've often had people come and see me and, and talk about these things uh, with me. I remember distinctly Joel Jacobs uh, coming to me and saying he had a real sense of call upon his life to go and get trained and go to India. And now he's in Australia serving Christ there with the hope of going to India in the future. Uh, but this sort of thing is not sort of so unique uh, to the 21st century, but uh, uh, we have it spoken about in the scriptures. For example, in, in Acts 13, uh, we have the church at Antioch setting Barnabas and Paul apart to go on their first missionary journey. And uh, Barnabas and Paul felt called to go out and preach the gospel. Back in Isaiah 6, we have the Lord calling that young prophet Isaiah uh, in a dramatic way, sending him out on that unusual ministry to dull the minds of the people. Imagine that. Uh, and this morning I want to look at this call of Samuel and through this call perhaps encourage you all to think about what is God doing in my life? Is God calling me to something? And there are three points that I want to bring out in this passage uh, today. The first is the context, the context in which it's written. The second is the call and the third is the, the consequence. So it's the context, the call, uh, and the consequence. Firstly, the co context is uh, only in verse 1. Uh, you know, one of the things that you should always do when coming to a Bible passage is put the passage into its context. Uh, its immediate context, but also the context of the rest of, of Scripture. Uh, and I think when we do this, this passage, uh, we come to see that this passage is not just about a call on a certain person, but a, a, a desperate need that is facing uh, the children of Israel. Uh, verse 1 is a very sobering verse. Uh, it says, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no frequent vision. Uh, now this boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Uh, Samuel is this young boy. His mother was unable to have children and so uh, she promises the Lord that if she has a child, uh, she will give him back to the Lord. And that's exactly what she does. Samuel was born and, and Hannah being true to his word when the baby is weaned, takes Samuel back to the temple and gives him to Eli. I don't know what Eli thought, having this child running around, but he, he gives him back to uh, Eli, the priest, and Samuel lives in the temple and serves in the temple. But while this might seem inspiring, uh, that here is a young boy set apart for Christian service at this very young age, uh, the situation in Israel is incredibly desperate. We're told uh, that the word of the Lord was rare and there was no frequent vision. You know that, that phrase, the word of the Lord was rare. So rare, in fact, that even when young Samuel heard it, he actually doesn't recognize that this is the Lord speaking. He thinks it is Eli. Even though he'd been living in the house of the Lord uh, uh, for that time. And there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, the historical context. As Sam said uh, about three weeks ago, uh, the beginning of the book of Samuel starts at the end of the time of the book of Judges. The book of Ju in the book of Judges, we have this pattern of behavior uh, happening. The people of God uh, reject God, uh, they reject the Lord and his word. Uh, they then get into all sorts of trouble and find themselves captive to the enemies around them. Uh, and then uh, they cry out to God for help. And the Lord graciously provides a judge to deliver them. Uh, and that judge does. And then uh, they 
get on with the Lord for a little while and then they reject him and the pattern carries on again. And uh, by the time you get to the end of the book of Judges, it almost seems God has given up on them. And we read this, and Samuel mentioned it in his sermon. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's secular humanism. Uh, uh, It was rampant. Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. The Lord has been totally disregarded. His word has been disregarded. Evil is rampant. Uh, People doing their own thing. Uh, isn't, and isn't that the same as what we see in our society today? Today we live in that same sort of society that young Samuel uh, lived in and was growing up in. Truth determined uh, not by the word of God, but by the individual. Uh, rights and wrongs determined not by God's standard, not by God's word, but by the individual because uh, 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 the word of the Lord was rare. Uh, This is the world that you and I are called to minister in. This is the sort of society that God has called us to, a world uh, where we are to be salt and light in. This is the world that uh, you you and I are called to proclaim the gospel. Uh, It is a world where if you try to bring God's truth to bear, the truth of God's word, you're you're likely to be ridiculed or you're likely to be despised uh, as we found uh, uh, a year or two ago with Israel Folau when he spoke the word of God. It's a world where it's more fashionable to be a transgender person than it is to be a Christian. Uh, it's a world where the media looks for every opportunity to denigrate the church and treat them with contempt. It's a world where the, the media has more sympathy for Islam than it does for Christianity. It's a world that uh, you and I are called to be salt and light in, uh, to stand up for the truth of God's word no matter how unpalatable it is to the hearers. Samuel was living in a similar world where everyone was doing right in their own eyes. Uh, Where the word of God was being disregarded, where the word of God was rare, we're told, and there were no visions. But secondly, the second reason the word of God was rare was because of the religious scene, and we saw that last week. In the, in the previous chapter, we have the rejection and God's judgment on the house of Eli, these priests. Eli and the family had been set apart as priests to, to minister and to serve uh, in the house of the Lord in, in Shiloh to bring the word of God, but, but Eli's sons were a disgrace. And Eli could not get them under control, and so the Lord rejects this family. Uh, In fact, uh, they didn't bring the word of God. Uh, They became fat, living off the the benefits of being priests. They took the best of the sacrifice. They ate the the fatty parts, the most tasty parts of uh, of the sacrifice. And even Eli, who should have known better, he becomes fat, as we see in the next chapter, and he falls off his chair and breaks his neck because he's so fat. I hope I don't become like that. (laughs) Eli's sons took advantage of women. They were an utter disgrace. No wonder the the word of the Lord was rare. You see, those who were meant to bring the word of the Lord uh, to the people were living it up. They were uh, living in sin. And furthermore, even their father Eli, who knew better, uh, doesn't seem to be able to do anything about it. He lets it carry on. And so God judges this family. It's a real lesson to us, isn't it? That the Lord does not tolerate false worship. He does not tolerate false worship. That the Lord does not tolerate those who are meant to be bringing the word of the Lord to the people and bringing true worship to the people. We see that back in in Moses' day with Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, brought false worship and the Lord judged them. 
Uh, they were consumed, we're told, before the Lord. These were Aaron's sons. Aaron, this very important man in, in uh, the children of Israel, his sons are killed. We see it in the days of the book of Judges with, uh, when the Levites, who were meant to be serving the Lord, end up behaving worse than the world they were living in. No wonder James says in James 3, 1, it says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that uh, we who teach will be judged with the greatest strictness. Those who teach will be judged with the greatest strictness. It's a lesson for any of those who want to teach the word of God. Yeah, I remember as a young pastor setting out on ministry, an older pastor said to me once, said, there's three things that will destroy your ministry, Richard. It's uh, gold or glory or girls. He's right. He's right. Gold or glory or girls. But they do not just destroy a pastor's ministry. They undermine and render ineffective Christian ministry up and down the land, don't they? And we see that uh, coming through our media time and time again as they um, talk about uh, uh, rape situations and, and sexual fornication and so forth. No wonder the Apostle John says in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, uh, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world. And he says, The world is passing away along with its desires, and whoever does the will of God abides forever. Eli's two sons, Hophni and and Phineas uh, loved the world. They, uh, they never spoke or lived out the word of God. You know, one of the sad things that I find happening in the church today is that many local churches are abandoning the word of God. Isn't that sad? Again and again I hear from people who are visiting say, it's great to hear the word of God being read and, and preached. All we get is motivational talks. A few years ago, the Anglican Church voted to bless same-sex marriage. The world has come into the church. You know, this is the type of religious world that you and I are called to minister in. Just like Samuel, where the world has crept into the church, where the, the trends of our society, like feminism, biculturalism, seem to be more important than the gospel and the word of God. Where homosexuality is, is, is considered to uh, more and more to become the norm of Christian living. We're told that the word of the Lord was rare. The word of the Lord was rare. Let us preach the word of God. Secondly, we have the call of Samuel, uh, verses 2 to 18. Here we have uh, young Samuel living in the temple of the Lord, serving there, helping Eli, Eli the, 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 the priest out. Eli the priest is old, he's almost gone blind. Look at verses 2 and 3. At that time Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God not, had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. It suggests that uh, 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 when the Lord calls Samuel, it was probably early in the morning just before daybreak as uh, the lamps in the temple had nearly gone out. His, was one of his jobs was to fill the lamps with oil every morning. But perhaps more importantly, uh, Eli's sort of uh, blindness was a reflection of what was happening in the temple. Uh, God's word was really spoken or heard of in the temple. Uh, uh, the lights were going out. Fortunately, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. There was still a flicker of flame. There was still a flicker of light. God's judgment had come upon Eli and his family, this family that was supposed to bring God's word, this family that was supposed to point people to the Lord, had failed to do so. 
Sure, Eli had tried and failed. His children had lost the plot. Eli no longer has any authority over his kids anymore. They're a disgrace. But you know, the Lord is merciful. The Lord is just. And here in this chapter, we see the kindness of God manifesting uh, himself. Uh, look at the, the ver- first part of verse 4. Then the Lord called Samuel. The Lord here puts his hand upon this young boy's life and calls him. You know, Samuel's mother, Hannah, had put this baby, uh, set this baby apart for that very thing. Now, there's a lot of you who have got young babies and children, and uh, I wonder if you are going to set your children apart for the Lord. Hannah did. The Lord does not leave his people and let them starve. Instead, he he raises up people to be his mouthpiece. And, you know, I see that in in Howard Baptist here where where there are young men and women whom God is raising up and I'm sure is, is going to set apart to go out and preach the gospel. Maybe the Lord is placing his hand on you this morning. Maybe he's wanting you to perhaps even lead a Bible study or teach in Sunday school. Maybe the Lord is is wanting one of you to run Christianity Explored in your home with some uh, non-Christian people. Here the the Lord calls Samuel. uh, Look at verses 4 to 6. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And uh, and Samuel arose and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you call me. But he said, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again uh, the third time and he arose and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you, call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and if he calls you, you shall say, speak Lord for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Three times Samuel heard God's call, but he doesn't recognize it. And there are three things that I just want you to notice just coming out of that passage there. Firstly, in verse 7, Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of God had not yet been revealed to him. Isn't that amazing? Remember, Samuel had been living in the temple of Shiloh uh, uh, all that time. He had been sitting under Eli, the the priest's ministry, and and serving him. He had been sleeping, actually, by the ark of the Lord, and yet he does not seem to know the Lord. These priests had neglected their ministry. Perhaps the word of God wasn't preached. Perhaps it was because of the worldliness of Eli's family. It's it's sad to think that Samuel didn't know the Lord. I wonder if your children know the Lord. You know, fortunately, salvation is a work of the Lord, and the Lord had set his affections upon uh, Samuel from, from eternity past. And here he, he was, not only effectually calling uh, Samuel to himself, but calling him to, to bring the word of God to the people, to be God's mouthpiece. Samuel had not yet heard the Lord heard the word of God. The second thing we notice that comes out so clearly is Samuel's response. Three times the the, the Lord calls and three times Samuel responds, here am I, you called me. 
I love that response. It seems so uh, immediate, doesn't it? Samuel was eager to serve, even though it seems to be early in the morning. Remember in Isaiah 6, uh, when the young prophet Isaiah has this vision of the Lord, he has this vision of the Lord enthroned in the heavenlies. The cherubim were, were ministering to the Lord. The Lord was high and lifted up. And in verse 8 of Isaiah 6, he, he says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah was eager to serve the Lord. Here am I, send me. In the same way, Samuel was eager to serve. I wonder how eager we are to serve. I wonder how eager we are to serve. I wonder how quick we are uh, to, to respond when the need arises. Here I am. Send me. I want to do it. Samuel's eager to serve. And the third thing we notice is the Lord's persistence. You know, it took four goes before young Samuel recognized it as the Lord who was calling. Again, it shows the grace of God, doesn't it? To people who are so often hard of hearing like us. We see that in the New Testament when Jesus confronts Peter in John 21. Remember, Peter had, had denied Jesus three times before the, the cross and, and, and even cursed Jesus. But Jesus is so gracious and merciful that after his resurrection he, he seeks Peter out on the, on the banks of the Sea of Galilee and he, he cooks him breakfast and he serves him breakfast and he takes Peter aside and he says, do you love me, Peter? You know that I love you. Do you love me, Peter? You know that I like you a lot. Peter, do you even like me a lot? And Peter says, you know I like you a lot. And he says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Such grace, isn't it? Such grace. Here in, in Samuel we see God's grace being manifest uh, to a people doing their own thing, calling a boy who hadn't yet known him. Look at verses 10 and 11. And the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the, the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. You know, the Lord is calling Samuel to bring the word of God to bear on people's hearts in Israel that will make their ears tingle. And then he, it's almost like a warning to Samuel. He, he says, but uh, don't be like those who, who haven't brought the word of God, who've neglected the word of God. And verses 12 to uh, uh, 18, uh, Eli's family, whom I have judged already, The Lord calls Samuel. He calls Samuel. And thirdly, we have uh, the, the consequence, verses 19 to 21. And I should note from the very start, in the very next chapter, Eli's two sons were killed in the battle and Eli fell uh, uh, over uh, after sitting down, broke his neck. Judgment came swiftly on the house of Eli. The Lord was true to his word. But for Samuel, look what it says in verse 19. Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Isn't that, mar that marvellous? In other words, God honoured Samuel. Up until now, Samuel was known as the boy who served in, in the temple at Shiloh. But no longer is Samuel the boy anymore. He's man. 
Furthermore, none of his words fell to the ground. That is, when he spoke the word of God, uh, the word of the Lord, God used them. They were not wasted. Uh, God's word did not return to him empty, but accomplishes uh, uh, and prospers in the thing for which it is sent. In other words, when the word of God is, is, uh, is preached and proclaimed, it's not in vain. We do not have to modify it. We do not have to make it more palatable. We do not have to use it sparingly in case it, it offends some poor person. For God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to speak into people's lives and convict people. Furthermore, we said in verse 20 that, that all Israel honored and recognized Samuel as the prophet of the Lord. From Dan in the north uh, to Beersheba in the south, people knew that this was God's man with God's word. And lastly, the Lord appeared in Shiloh again and revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh. How did he do it? By the word of the Lord. You see, the word of God is first and foremost about Jesus. It's here in the, in the pages of Scripture that, that we get to know Jesus. We get to hear about his marvelous grace to, to sinners such as ourselves. It's here in the pages of Scriptures that we see how, how Jesus died on a cross for us how he rose again to give us eternal life. To neglect the word is to neglect Jesus, for in the word of God we get to know him. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And of course, Samuel brought God's word throughout Israel no matter how unpalatable it was to some. The Lord used uh, Samuel to anoint kings and even to bring judgment upon a king, King Saul. He was God's mouthpiece, bringing God's word to his people, pointing people to the Lord. But you know, in a similar way, the Lord has called us to be his disciples to all nations, teaching people through his word that through his word, people will get to know Jesus. Are you doing that today? Are you so immersed in God's word that through your life and through word, Jesus is being made known? Or have you brought into the way of the world as Eli's family had, that you are living your life like the world does, that you're doing right, what is right in your own eyes rather than the word of God? Samuel, though young when he was called, heard the word of the Lord and responded and lived by it. And through it, God revealed himself to this young boy and to the nation of Israel. May this be a challenge to us all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this marvelous passage, for the challenge it is to us, your people, living in similar times to what Samuel lived. Help us to be a people who responds quickly to your call upon our lives to go into all the world and make disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.